partner at Grant Thornton Thailand, who will be telling us about uh, um, the, his, uh, Grant Thornton's International Business Report 2008, uh, specifically on the CSR portion of that. Even though it's a fairly small group in a small room, I've been told I need to use the microphone so they can tape what I'm saying, which sounds a bit frightening. <laughs> and to be quite honest with you, I'm, I'm very nervous about today's presentation. I, I do a lot of public speaking on a lot of topics, business management topics. But today I'm speaking to an audience that know more about the topic than I do. <laughs> um, I'm sure you all understand the CSR topic and you, you've obviously you've come to these meetings, so it's obviously something of great interest to you. So. Uh, you will probably know more about it than I do, and if I make any mistakes and say anything really stupid, I hope you'll forgive me. What I'm going to present to you today is uh, the findings of a survey. Um, the survey is um, something that we at Grant Thornton run every year. Um, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about the survey first so you can have some understanding of where these numbers come from. The, the survey, we call it the International Business Report, IBR. And uh, we used to call it the International Business Owners Survey because we focused on um, interviewing owners of business. Um, these days we kind of broaden that to cover executives and, um, and managing directors. It's essentially designed to provide geographic comparisons between business behavior in different countries around the world. And uh, we, we survey 7,200 business leaders across 34 countries. And if you take the total GDP of all of the 34 countries involved, it comes to something like 83% of the global GDP of the world, which gives you an idea that this is a pretty representative of, of uh, across the world. In each country, we, depending on the size of the country and the, the importance of the country to the survey, we interview between uh, 300, 400 businesses in each country. Uh, the survey is prepared um, each year as we go into the end of the year. Um, we prepare it in both local language and, and English so that uh, it can be understood by the, uh, the business leaders. And we donate $5 to every um, completed survey, which uh, adds up to a, a small sum of money for UNICEF. Thailand was included in the global survey for the first time in 2006, so we've now got three years of data uh, building up, and it's starting to be quite interesting to see some of the trends forming. Um, for example, um, one of the f very first questions that we ask at the beginning of each year is how optimistic is the business owners about the coming year? And um, 2006, 2007, 2008, we went 30% positive, 9% positive, 30% negative. So it's been an interesting slide as, uh, as this, and, and when, you, when you go beyond that and ask, what, is the, what are the drivers behind that concern and uh, uh, overall pessimism? It, number one factor always comes up with political stability. So obviously something that caused an impact throughout those years. We use a professional survey firm um, with support from our team. Um, we do the interviews in both Thai and English. They're, they're done on an interview basis rather than just sending out forms. Um, we have 30, 300 companies in Thailand and what we do is we prepare a profile of companies. We get the complete list of companies from the Ministry of Commerce, profile them, and we then mix them into um, uh, groups by um, industry, geography within the country, the company type, whether it's privately owned or publicly owned, and the size of the company uh, by overall revenue. And we try, and, and once we've got the sort of groups roughly the right spread, we then randomly select from each group. Uh, to get our 300 companies. We have a process whereby if we don't get a response or someone refuses to respond to the survey, um, then we will actually pick another company so we get the full 300. But uh, the last three years in a row, we've had a 100% response rate. And um, I'm not too sure what we're doing right, but it's really working well. <laughs> um, the survey covers many topics. And these are some of them. E economic outlook, business expectations, where we look at revenue, exports, imports, etc. Business constraints, what are the key, key constraints to business development. Um, impact of emerging markets, the so-called BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China. 
and, uh, and Vietnam, of course, in this part of the world. Um, super growth companies, how many co companies are growing at a, what we call the super growth rate, um, and uh, an, an area that Thailand has uh, slipped away as well over the last couple of years. Risk management, we survey corporate social responsibility, workforce immigration, movement of workforce around both skilled and unskilled. Workforce skills, what are the kind of the key gaps and issues that companies are, are, are struggling with in terms of getting the appropriate workforce in place. Business planning approaches, how do they go about doing their business planning, when do they do it, how do they do it, what techniques do they apply. Always gets a lot of interest, executive stress, what are the stress rates of executives, are they going up, going down, how do they compare country to country. And women in business, and this, this uh, was one that we've done every year and uh, gets a lot of interest, and particularly gets a lot of interest in Thailand, and uh, I'll just diverge for a second on this topic, the, the women in the room. Thailand is the third best place in the world for women to take on executive roles in terms of opportunities in business, uh, ranks number three in the world, uh, right up there with uh, Brazil and the Philippines, and uh, significantly higher than Europe, 27%, US, 22%, and Japan, which is the sad case, down at 7%. <coughs> but today, we're focusing on just that one part of the survey where we talked about co corporate social responsibility. And we have quite a bit of trend data on this because even though we didn't call it CSR for the first few years of the survey, you know, we had specific topics on energy management, waste management, um, uh, management of, of employees, um, and some of the things, some of the factors that, as you know, make up the whole bundle of, of things that we call corporate social responsibility. Um, a brief definition, once again, here I am starting to preach to the converted now, and this is what I was worried about. <laughs> uh, responsibility to all stakeholders, um, responsible to each other, businesses uh, responsible for their actions to a large number of stakeholders. So it's all about responsibility um, to, to stakeholders and, and a large number of stakeholders. What we're seeing from the survey, as we go beyond the survey and, and go into some of the uh, qualitative questions behind the survey, um, we see businesses um, being increasingly concerned about the, their customers and their, their view of, of the customers as them as an ethical organization. And we see organizations, you know, rightly or wrongly, uh, you know, promoting themselves as, a, as an ethical organization. You know, we see organizations like you know, British Petroleum, BP, making it the, the sort of entire plank of their advertising strategy for three years, um, you know, their, their ethical behavior. Um, so we see both at the retail customer level and at the corporate customer level um, this impact. And one of the things, one of the trends that we've seen in the data, which I'll, I'll show you in numerically later, is the impact in the supply chain. You know, if, when you looked at the numbers five years ago, particularly across uh, Europe and the US, you saw that um, big multinationals all had CSR. You know, we've got a CSR policy, we, we, we do these things, et cetera. But then you got to the smaller companies, the SMEs, the privately owned businesses, you know, never heard of CSR, had no interest in it. Um, what we're seeing now, though, is because the major multinationals are pushing down the supply chain, looking for CSR behavior in their suppliers, um, it's driving that behavior and we're now seeing a lot more res increase in response from privately owned businesses and small businesses to, uh, to the whole topic. One of the other interesting things that came out of this year's survey is employees and it becomes one of the major drivers now, um, not yet in Thailand I'm afraid, um, but in, in many countries around the world a major driver for CSR behavior, CSR improvements, is because of the employees. The, the, the um, competition for skilled employees obviously gets greater and greater each year as, um, as uh, companies compete for their staff coming out of MBA programs. And we find that uh, more and more employees are considering this in their um, approach and uh, in, in the selection of the company that they're prepared to work with. And of course, we also see a lot more pressure these days from government regulations. Um, more effort into uh, you know, the green green practices, um, proper ethical behavior towards employees, etc. So a lot more drivers coming from the government regulation sector, and that will obviously continue to increase. We are seeing, um, as I mentioned before, an increasing trend in 
CSR behavior right across the board. But there are some differences. Um, and there are some differences in the way cust uh, companies perceive their uh, need to implement uh, CSR. We find that what we call privately held businesses, businesses typically SMEs, although there are some very large uh, privately held businesses, they have less stakeholders to, to worry about. They've got less regulatory environment conditions to, to work towards. They've got less public interest in their activities. They've got less uh, you know, impact from uh, stakeholders and shareholders, etc. And so their main concern is to, is to make sure that they can continue to their business, you know, continue to grow their business, tough e economic environment. So CSR, where CSR supports that economic growth of their business, then they like it. Where it does not support or, or maybe detracts or has a cost impact, then they don't like it. Although, as I mentioned before, we are seeing this coming from the, um, the supply chain. Um, larger multinationals have obviously larger powerful state groups, or stakeholder groups, and we see a lot more uh, activity in those areas. Although from the um, multinationals, we also see a lot of lip service, and you'll see the impact of that when we get to the numbers in a minute. We have a lot of organizations that um, claim to have a CSR policy and even a CSR department and yet when you ask them about CSR specific actions, the uh, number is much, much less. So there are obviously a lot of companies sort of putting up the window dressing of CSR and not necessarily following through. We looked at um, a number of different areas um, in the survey and we had a series of questions around different aspects of CSR. You know, corporate social responsibility towards customers, you know, in terms of being honest about your products and services, in terms of being quick to disclose problems and resolve problems and you know, withdraw problematic products from the market and all those sorts of things. Um, the same with uh, in the supplier area. You know, we ask companies about what are their CSR behavior through their supplier network. Do they check to make sure the suppliers are also using ethical behavior towards their workforce, towards uh, their manufacturing, etc. Environmental, obviously, that's one of the key issues that uh, everyone knows about. Re government requirements, what are, their, what are their attitude towards uh, government requirements, government policies, tax incentives. We ask them about community, how do they support the community, uh, both through donations, both through getting involved in social programs. Health and safety and employees, sort of ethical behavior towards making sure that employees are working in a, a healthy, safe environment, making sure that employees having a a friendly, safe, uh, and, and healthy workplace. And we see a lot of organizations now talking about this concept of employer branding. And there's a very strong co correlation we see in the numbers between organizations that talk about employer branding and organizations that have strong CSR programs. Because as I showed you on the earlier slide, a lot of younger people today, as they're looking for their, their jobs, uh, they take this into uh, consideration. And obviously, um, products and services being key area as well. Once again, I'm definitely preaching to the converted here, so I'll zoom through this slide fairly quickly and get on to the numbers. Um, we often talk to our clients. Um, someone was asking me over lunch, who, who were our clients? And you know, Grant Thornton in Thailand, we're a, both a financial services firm and a management consultancy firm, as well as an executive recruiting firm. And John's here from that side today. Um, we advise a lot of clients about these kind of issues as we, through our management consultancy program. Um, we help them with risk management, we help them with social responsibility programs, etc. cetera. And, uh, a lot of the time we, we're talking to senior executives, um, particularly in, with at large Thai corporations, um, and helping them understand what are some of the benefits of uh, implementing a CSR program because it's not always obvious to them. They think it's just going to be a, a, another cost burden. So. Enhancing corporate competitiveness and customer loyalty, classic example being British Petroleum that changed the whole view, the way people view that company. Um, staff attraction and retention, how to uh, attract the, the best staff and keep them. Uh, obviously, keeping a good relationship with local authorities, um, being socially responsible towards tax, towards um, environmentally con concerns and things like that. Cost reduction through energy efficiency and reducing waste. Profit improvement. Um, new, new profitable products and services that address um, the uh, customer's interest in, in greener products. Risk management, 
um, you know, CSR, corruption scandals, environmental incidences, these things can have a, a very detrimental impact on an organization's reputation. So there's some very good risk management regions for implementing CSR. Um, and building a culture of just doing the right thing, as we see today. You know, we all know who the companies are that generally do the right thing. We all have a good image about the name of those kind of companies compared to others that we know may not be always doing the right thing. So offsetting many of the risks that, uh, that can occur. And easier access to capital. Investors these days are looking at some of these issues. Not all of CSR obviously is of major interest to the investor, but certainly some of them. Um, environmental impact, for example, uh, very significant interest to investors because that can have a huge impact on their return on their investment down the track if there's big cleanup costs associated with um, environmental issues. And we looked at, um, just uh, in, in putting this uh, presentation today, we had a look at uh, a couple of different clients and uh, people we've worked with in the past and we, th we feel had something uh, to say about um, uh, CSR. PTT has been doing this for, for quite a long time. They've been a client of mine for, um, for many years. It was the first client I ever worked with when I first came to Thailand 15 years ago. And I've seen a big change in their attitude towards CSR. Whenever, when I first worked there, the governor used to grumble about the fact that every so often the Ministry of Finance would ring him and say, pitch in some more money. We need some money for, to, for this project. And you know, there were some, obviously some projects that he couldn't grumble about, but uh, some of the, you know, the royal projects, he, they just funded up the money. But it was always a burden on them. It was always something they didn't, they weren't doing it because they wanted to do it. They were doing it because some senior government official would give them a ring and tell them they had to do it. But today, uh, they, they start to see it as part of their corporate responsibility, but also as part of their image in the marketplace as being an organization that maybe hasn't quite got there yet, but is certainly moving towards greater social responsibility. And um, they spend a lot of time and effort, and they have a whole team of people that's attached to the uh, CEO's office who just work on these um, various range of projects that they're doing. Cathay Pacific, um, an organization that uh, have you know, obviously, you probably realize, been through some financial issues over the last 10 years, but uh, took on CSR as a major driver um, and uh, have implemented it right through their organization, but particularly in areas where it could have a bottom line effect. They were, they're an organization that have seen that they can obviously improve their bottom line by you know, being more fuel efficient, by uh, keeping the noise down, giving them more opportunities to land in different airports at different times of day and things like that. And Starbucks, which is a client of ours in the US, um, probably one of the world's leaders in CSR. You know, you know, if you're not just paying lip service to CSR, I mean, you, you do see a lot of CSR advertising through Starbucks. If you go into a Starbucks today, you'll find that they're advertising that they're supporting the people who grow the coffee for them. Um, but it, this is more than just lip service in their case. It's something that flows right through the whole organization um, in terms of support, the whole supply chain that they work with, etc. Let me get on with some numbers because I think that's what you're probably most interested in. Um, first of all, these are some global numbers. Um, and we ask the question, what drives your corporate responsibility? What are the key drivers that would make you behave in a, in a more corporately responsible way? And we found that um, right up there in, the, in, the, in the, the top of all of them right now is recruitment, staff retention. This is the global average. And uh, that's changed. That definitely wasn't up there in the top um, three when this survey was first started uh, seven or eight years ago. And we've seen it gradually jump its way up year by year. So clearly, as I mentioned before, the idea that to attract good quality staff, particularly amongst the younger people who are, who are very um, conscious about these kind of things, it's very important. Cost management still very high up there, managing the cost of energy, managing the cost of, um, of uh, waste management, things like that. <coughs> Public attitude, brand building, uh, people wanting to be seen as corporately responsible. Tax relief, um, 44 percent, uh, sorry, sorry, 44, an average of 44 total across the world is very significant. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that number again when we get to the Thailand page. Generally, saving, we sort of categorize these things as sort of saving the planet kind of issues, um, not quite up in the middle band. Investor relations, 
lower down and, and government pressure quite low. So this is, this is a global pattern. Now, you'll see as, as if you were to look into each in individual country around the world that these numbers would all be skewed in all sorts of different directions, as we'll see for Thailand. But interesting that uh, this staff retention plan is coming up there right at the top. And, um, you know, the, the, I think the cost control one is very closely related to energy management, and that's come up as, as something very high in, in the survey right across the board. In Thailand, we saw 94% saying that tax relief was the thing that was going to drive their CSR behavior. Very high number. The highest number of any respondent country in the world, uh, and way up above everyone else. And uh, this is very interesting to us. I mean, really scratch my head to try and think what's beyond that. And it's interesting because Thailand, you know, Grant Thornton has a whole bunch of tax advisory services. My colleague who sits in the office next to me is a tax advisor advising multinationals who bring coming into Thailand. And Thailand has very poor, very low tax relief for CSR behavior. And yet 94% are saying that's the thing that will drive their behavior. So I, I, I just wonder whether they were using the survey as a cry to the government, you know, give us some tax relief and we'll behave ourselves. Not sure. <laughs> but uh, quite significant. Cost management up there very high. Government pressure, obviously in the environmental area. Um, but uh, this number, staff recruitment, uh, quite low compared to the rest of the world. Um, quite a low driver in the ranking. Tw ranked 25th in the world in terms of st saying that recruitment staff retention was important for CSR. Which, um, you know, I guess is a bit of a message for the younger people of Thailand that they probably ought to be doing more uh, in terms of, you know, when they're looking for a job, thinking about these issues or being vocal about these issues. Maybe, maybe they think about them, but they're not so vocal about them. Um, but uh, interesting uh, twist on the, on the numbers from the rest of the world. Unfortunately, for Thailand, when we look at the actual CSR activities, we fall behind the rest of the world by a long way. And in many cases, we, we're on the bottom of the list. We even, in, in, in many of these factors, even countries like Vietnam do better. And this, these questions are very specifically worded and asked, and, and, and the, the, the people who do the surveys specifically dig beyond the uh, initial response to try and get to CSR actions. We don't want, we don't give people a tick in the box if they say, yeah, we have a policy of equality. We give them a tick in the box if they can claim some specific actions that they've done that demonstrate equality. Now, I picked a, a strange example because equality at work is probably not a huge issue in Thailand. Um, but it's, as a, the point I'm trying to make is that these percentages are based on companies that have performed specific actions in the last 12 months on these categories. So let's have a look at some of them. Promote health and wealth being, health and wealth, well being of the employees. Global average 71%, Thailand 35% ranking bottom of the world. Um, yes, we see some of our um, Thai companies providing some facilities, uh, some advice to their staff, but nothing that you would see in, uh, in, in many other countries of the world where they're promoting the health of their staff, they're encouraging their staff to be healthy, um, they, they actually build that you know, into the, uh, the way they manage their staff. Um, not, not as bad off in the internship and work experience area. Um, this one we we actually, to, to get the numbers, we actually asked of how many interns they, they would bring into their company each year. Um, I was a bit surprised that Thailand was lower because I, I, I often see interns, we, we, we use a lot of interns in our company, and I often see our clients having interns wandering in and out for a few months each year. But I think what you've got to remember when we look at all of these numbers is we're, we're looking at the average of 300 Thai companies, and we're looking at companies that <coughs> reflect the overall profile of the Thai marketplace. So a lot of these companies, numerically, are SMEs. And SMEs probably don't promote the health and well-being of their employees. 
probably don't have interns and work experience people coming in. So I think that's why the numbers uh, are a little bit low. This was one that uh, surprised everybody. And um, in fact, that, <laughs> that question alone is what prompted this very speech today because I rang Alex Mavro to talk about this. Why, why would Thai companies be so low, bottom of the ladder in the world, and bottom of the ladder by a long way, the, the next nearest countries, so quite a long way above us, in terms of donating to the community? Yeah. I mean, I know that once again, a lot of my large corporate clients do donate. I see them donate. I, I hear of it. I think th there's a number of factors here, I think, and you know, there's probably people in the room who can discuss this better than I can, but I think some of the factors are that in Thailand, companies don't donate to charity because individuals donate to charity. Um, it's all part of the, 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 the tambun. Um, a company can't tambun. A person can tambun. So therefore, donations were more likely to be made by the family that owns the business rather than the business itself, the, the, the money for donations to temples, to charities, rather than coming out of corporate funds, would come out of the, the family's personal pocket. So I think if we, you know, if we went beyond those numbers, we'd probably find that, you know, because I, I don't believe that the Thai people are sort of stingy people who don't donate to charity. I think what we're seeing here is that Thai companies as, as such don't do donate very much to charity. The other factor that may be considered, and this is one that Alex raised with me, is that um, if you are donating money, um, uh, in the Thai culture, it's best not to make a big song and dance about it. So you, you do it quietly. You, you achieve more tambun if you do it quietly and, um, and uh, don't, don't talk about it. So, so maybe some of the respondents said, you know, well, no, we haven't donated to the community, but maybe they have. The quality at work, um, quite low, um, but not, as I said, not a really big issue in Thailand. What is that? My telephone is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it sounds exactly the same as mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, bottom in the world for allowing flexible working hours, allowing your staff to, to work half days, allowing you know, people to come in and work certain places, allowing them to work from home if, if necessary. Bottom of the rank in the world. Um, Improved waste management, um, quite low as well. Um, obviously not an issue that uh, is being pushed in Thailand by regulatory um, things, and so we see a lot of waste issues. And I think you, know, you can experience this yourself if you go and visit some of the industrial estates around Thailand. Waste management is clearly not a very hot issue. We see some improvement in this area of improved energy efficiency. And this is one trend that in Thailand over the last three years we have seen improve each year. Um, companies that are doing some actions about energy efficiency. Companies that are based largely in offices, turning off the lights, turning off the computers. Um, factories that are implying, uh, putting in new equipment to make sure that their energy costs are less. So we do see energy efficiency as being an area where there is some improvement and um, Thailand has come up to, uh, to rank 24 where it was a, was a bit lower a couple of years ago. And this is another number that um, I can't explain well in my own mind, participating in community activities. Here we, we, we and, and as we do the survey, we give the respondent a number of examples to, to, to pick from, you know, you know as, a, as, a, as a company getting involved in you know, helping under, under privileged people, you know, building schools, building water pumps, going to the rural sector, doing things, not donating money, but actually physically doing something, participating in, a, in some active way. And uh, once again, bottom in the world and a uh, very, very low response, only 4% saying that they actively did something in the community activity in the last 12 months. So it was a little bit disappointing to us when we got these numbers and it was fairly hard for us to, to publish them because uh, and uh, we did get a fair bit of um, a fair bit of criticism for, for having published these numbers. We've got a number of, number of people r ringing us and um, even some people sending in letters saying, you know, we've got it wrong. These numbers are not right. Ties are not the kind of people who would get numbers like this and this. But um, the, we've been back over the survey detail in, in great detail. Obviously, when we, heard the, when we first saw these numbers, it was 
oh my God, maybe the numbers are wrong, please be wrong. And we were digging through the numbers and checking and went back to the original score sheets that, that were done and I'm afraid the numbers are what they are. Only 25% of Thai business leaders said that they would change their products and services to reduce their negative environmental or social impact. It's a very low number. Um, I had an opportunity of presenting this, this presentation to the National Economic Ad and Social Advisory Council a couple of weeks ago and they, they called on Friday and they asked me to present this to the, um, um, to the cabinet in sometime in the next few weeks, um, which is a little bit scary. <laughs> I wish I could find a way of declining that one. Um, but it's clearly something that, that the Thai government, Thai people, um, Thai business community needs to do start doing something about so corporate social responsibility. It, uh, it shows a very poor picture. Um, here's interesting. And this is I, this coming back to the point I mentioned earlier. When we ask the question, do you have a formal policy in place for corporate social responsibility, 64% of the Thai respondees said yes. We have a formal policy in place. They've, so someone has gone to the trouble of writing a document, maybe getting it approved by the board. Um, then you compare that to the numbers I showed you on the earlier pages where you look at specific actions that they've taken towards corporate so responsibility and there's a complete dichotomy. Um, and it's not the first time we've seen this, I'm afraid, because we, we also did a part of the survey um, that we, we haven't yet published this year is corporate governance. And we saw exactly the same dichotomy where a lot of Thai companies claim that they have formal policies in place for corporate governance. But when you specifically go and ask about actions that they take, how do they deal with corporate governance issues, how do they deal with, with um, breaches of their corporate government policies, it doesn't exist, it hasn't happened. So. Uh, it's, it's almost an issue, and we see a number of other companies as well that um, pay strong lip service to being, you know, we have the policy, but uh, actually have very little effect. Yet we see countries like New Zealand where only 35% of the respondents say we have a corporate CSR policy. And yet, if you go into the, the data and you look at New Zealand, they're up there in the top two or three on all of the, all of the actual actionable issues. They're top in donating to charity, top in um, energy management, top in health, uh, health and safety for employees. So the policy seems to be almost at uh, odds with the, uh, with the actions. And um, maybe, as we were talking about over lunch, maybe it's more of a mindset thing rather than something that you can officially support in, in policy. However, the survey has shown conclusively globally that this CSR is no longer just the domain of large corporates. It's now a necessity rather than a choice. As I showed you earlier, the supply chain impact is pushing it right down through smaller companies. And as we see through the survey results every year, more and more companies adopting CSR, it's clearly a very significant um, part of maintaining a, a sustainability in a business. And it's not something that is no longer sort of thrown to the, the back room or a board level issue that doesn't actually drive down to staff level. It's now something that's um, important. The practices need to be put in place and um, have a significant impact on the sustainability of business. Any questions? Well, the, the, f the first thing that's very clear, I think, from the numbers is the, the taxation issue. Um, that right now, there's very little tax relief for CSR type of activities. Very little tax relief for donating to charity. Very little tax relief for uh, implementing better energy management policies, although the government is talking about those things. Right now, I, according to my tax people, there's very, very little real tangible bottom line tax benefit you can get from doing them. So, you know, given that governments can't do too much about mindset issues and uh, cultural issues, th they can do something definitely about taxation issues. And so you know, they've just announced that whole new tax package that came out two or three weeks ago, but none of those things were, dis were talking about, they're all economically based. They were, none of them were, were CSR or governance based. So 
I think that would be one of the key issues. Um, the second, uh, I think, recommendation would be about education. Um, you know, s clearly we see from younger people coming out of schools and MBA programs a lot more awareness of these things. But today they're not, they're not the decision makers and in, in this sort of hierarchical Asian structure it may take them 10, 20 years to get them into, into key decision making positions in, in many companies. Um, so you know, education programs for corporate leaders, making them more aware, um, uh, stronger regulation in some areas, um, waste management, energy management. You know, we, we, once again, the new government's making noises about energy management, but we've not yet seen anything tangible in terms of new policies. Waste management, an another key area that's uh, obviously a big, big issue, and um, you know, we see a lot of sort of pollution impact from poor waste management. So. I think it's, it's just to see we are, what governments can do is, is, is very limited. You know, it's taxation, it's policy, it's awareness and education. And I think you know, we've, what we could probably do as a result, I, as I said, I haven't really thought about how I'm going to present this to them yet. And, uh, uh, but it'll be sort of refining down to a few key points, like you know, give them sort of the top three things that I think they can do and uh, something like that. Yeah. I think it's a combination of both of those factors. I mean, definitely the supply chain impact has had a huge impact in China. We've seen a number of, of you know, problems over just in the last few months, and um, uh, there's a whole bunch of new initiatives going on. I was looking at a, a technology the other day which was allowing tracking of shipments, food shipments out of China, tracking them right to the destination to ensure that the temperature and conditions m remained ideal so that they, they weren't having all those issues with, with damaged food. And um, I think uh, it's just become a big issue in China. They, they see this huge impact of, of orders being cancelled and factories being cl closed down. And I think the Chinese government closed down 160,000 small businesses in the last two years on these kind of issues, uh, mainly through supply chain impact. Um, but yeah, so I think it's a combination of the two. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting point, and it's one of the things that I always struggle with this survey because not only is there different corporation, different sort of uh, profiles of business in in different countries, um, and Thailand clearly is one that numerically is dominated by the the SME, which has an um, obviously an impact on these numbers, but you also get cultural differences in the way people respond to surveys, and you can see that every year, and and, and you know. I've, I have no formal mechanism for discounting that, except for watching trends. Uh, you know, if the trend, for example, Singapore, India, and the Philippines are always incredibly optimistic in their results, and I think it's just part of the culture, the business culture of those those three countries. Um, and and yet, you know, we, we talk about economic optimism, and every year the sort of Philippines comes out sort of ninety-eight percent optimistic, and you see that their economy is sort of going like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's I shouldn't joke about the poor Philippines, but it's it's a it's a cultural thing, you know. That's just the way they think about things. And, and Thais, I think, tend to be a bit more pessimistic in their response to you know things. Things are always sort of doom and gloom, and uh, so you've got to somehow balance those factors. I don't know how to do that, but what we tend to tr tend to prefer is is look at trends over years within country, and we see that one country is going this way and another country is going that way. Another question. In their ability to execute on their business strategy, <coughs> yeah. um, actually we didn't. No, to be honest with you, we don't. Ha we we've asked questions about what kind of approach do they take to planning. Um, we found that 
a lot of Thai companies, particularly Thai, the larger Thai corporations, use very much a budget-focused approach to planning as opposed to a strategic or visionary approach to planning. Um, but we didn't see much impact in terms of, uh, we, we, did, we didn't ask the question, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Strategic planning and execution. That'd be a very interesting thing to look at. I'll uh, make a note of that and uh, see if we can squeeze it into next year's survey. <laughs> Not that I don't know of any, maybe somebody else does. Uh, a lot of organ large organizations use consulting firms like mine to do that kind of stuff. You know, we'll go in and we'll help them put together a CSR policy and help them th you know, think about ways of rolling it out and implementing it and finding a, a couple of quick wins to get, get the thing rolling and, and show people the benefits. But um, I don't know of any specific training organizations. Is there anyone else? But certainly education is, I think one of the things that came out of the, what, what we do each year is at the very end of the year, we take all of the survey results of the whole year, all of those topics that I showed you on the third or fourth slide, and we put together a Thailand report, and we present that at a number of different forums, including the, to the National Economic Social Advisory Council. Um, and in that, um, one of the things that comes out very strong, and from, from the, the feedback of, the, of all the businesses, they're all saying skills, skills, skills. What are their biggest constraint to growth? Skills. Lack of this, you know, what, lack of planning skills, lack of financial management skills, lack of decision making skills, mainly executive level skills of, of that nature, but they also, you know, lack of English skills, lack of computer skills, it sort of filters down. And, and Thailand ranks very highly in the world of, of companies that claim lack of skills as being a major constraint on their growth. And, um, so you know, we, we looked at that, and one of the recommendations that we, uh, we provided to, the, uh, to NISAC was that uh, they really need to think about you know, improving the education system to, to address some of these big gaps. If you think about some of the issues they're talking about, you know, decision-making skills, financial planning skills, analytical skills, um, they, they're not supported well by you know, a, a, an education system that's still ra largely rote-based. Um, and so it's clearly one of the things that, that, that we recommend was that they look at the, at the education policies of the country and think about moving away from rote-based learning to more you know, analytical-based learning. Mm. Thanks. You mentioned that uh, one of the proposals is to make apprenticeships visible, right? Mm. Well, it, it varies from factor to factor. The survey has, you know, the survey is done month by month throughout the year, and so by the end of the year, there's literally hundreds of, of, of lines of data, and it's some going up and some's going up and down, and, and so it's, it's, without looking specifically at each one, it's hard to answer the question. But uh, in the CSI area, um, the things that we see that are improving is energy management. Definitely, more companies saying that in the last 12 months they had energy management activities in place that they didn't have the previous two years. Um, other trends um, we see not, not improving, and the, the skill shortage one seems to be getting worse rather than better. How is this survey funded? We pay for it. Uh, my, uh, uh, sorry, Granthon's a global um, network of companies. Um, we, we have offices in about uh, 100 cities around the world. Each country is an independently owned member. So myself and, and a few other partners own the Thai entity, and we're part of this global network of Grant Thornton offices. And I think last year, our, bill, our part of the, one of the, we were one of the 34 countries that funded it, and I think we paid 
eighty thousand US dollars or something like that, and everyone else paid. The, the US and the UK probably paid a big, much bigger chunk because they get bigger revenues than we do. No, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> it's just part of our CSR. It's also part of our, um, you know, brand building. Um, yeah, brand building in the market. Yes. That, that, that would be a good idea. What, what we tried to do was when we, when we got a really strange number, like the 4% community service one, we actually then sort of got on the phone to a few friends. We talked to some of our clients. We, we did a little bit of an informal discussion um, with a few people to see whether there could be any understanding of where that number came from. Uh, we didn't put a lot of effort into it, but yeah. I think maybe a focus group would be a much better approach. Yeah. Based on Jackson's interest, you're going to have to go higher than the Yep, I, w I, I think that's a very good observation, though. The, the government, I mean, for those of us who've lived here all our lives or a good part of our lives, you don't see an awful lot of government noise about implementing these kinds of things. You know. They're too busy with, uh, holding on to their job. <laughs> one, of the, I mean, one of the, let's not get into a political discussion here, but one of the key issues with the Thai government is that the ministers rarely stay in their portfolio longer than a few months. No matter how stable the government is, they're swapping the ministers all the time, so no one ever gets a real chance to understand the job they're trying to do. Uh, you, were, you were talking about North Bank earlier. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I have a lot of respect for what they're trying to do. Yeah. Mm. Uh, on Nauk Twitter, I think I saw Vietnam up on the list, but what other, like, do there other Southeast Asian countries that were surveyed? And, and Definitely. Did you notice some, um, the major differences and major similarities between China and, and its export approaches compared to? Certainly, and um, we, we cover, Vietnam was included this year for the very first time. Uh, our partners over there just decided that they would like to join the survey. Um, but Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Philippines, China, um, where else? Quite a few, most of the major Southeast Asian economies uh, or, or North Asian economies, Japan, Korea, are included in the survey. Um, and yes, there are some very big differences. Um, and you know, we, when we look at uh, Singapore and Malaysia, they, oh, there's obviously a great deal of rivalry between the two. And, on, and even on CSR, it seems to flow on because they, those two are both quite, um, they stand out very highly as, as being countries that have implemented quite a bit of CSR activity and we see that flowing through into the, the respondents from the, um, the, the survey. Um, so yeah, they definitely. And even Vietnam, um, surprisingly enough, did respond quite highly um, up around you know, questions like the um, you know, donating to charity, doing social work, um, up around about the 40, 50 percent mark, if I remember rightly, uh, for those kind of responses. And, uh, and quite high for the number of companies that have CSR policies officially in place. So, uh, and that surprised me because I didn't expect Vietnam 
you know, in its current stage of development to have, have achieved that already. So, um, but the survey clearly showed that they're, they're moving forwards in the right direction. Um, we, um, unfortunately, in this response in the survey, in the CSR section, we are the basket case of Asia. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, in other areas, you know, like as I mentioned before, women in business, we're up there with one of the, the best places to be, but uh, I'm afraid on CSR we're not doing very well. That's probably. Yes. Yes, and, and maybe maybe it is being driven by the donor donor funding, um, and they they're insisting on certain CSR behaviour before the funding's made available. I mean, it could well be driven by that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That could be right. That's quite interesting, um, and I, we did we didn't ag w one of the things that we we came to the conclusion was that there's no pattern discernible from a geographical development status or political perspective. We couldn't find that you know right wing countries were better than left wing countries that Asia was better than Europe that. Um, there was no pattern. There was no pattern around development status that, that, that more developed regions were better than underdeveloped regions or, or vice versa. Um, and I don't actually have the numbers with me, but that was part of the, the sort of analysis that was done after the survey, and, and the, the pattern did not exist. The 64% of the people who were That 64% of the people who responded said, we have a policy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we didn't. We, we didn't pick anybody. We it was all to pick randomly. Yeah, it was all done randomly. Well, it, exactly. That was the dichotomy. Yeah. 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 No, and no, no, as I mentioned before, New Zealand, a case in point, where only thirty-five percent said they had a policy, but they actually implement a lot. Um, so there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of relationship between people who have policies and people who implement things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we said, as, as I mentioned earlier, we, we also found the same thing. Yeah. No. We. Yeah. And. Worldwide, it's 56%. Yeah. We use the numbers a lot with our clients, um, not so much from the CSR point of view. Uh, one example is risk management. We did a lot of work in the survey on risk management. There's a whole new, whole section on risk management. 
Um, right now we're helping quite a few Thai clients implement enterprise risk management, um, both in the banking sector and in the manufacturing sector. And we use a lot of the analysis that we did there in looking at what are some of the key, and the biggest question you ask is, you know, looking at a large company, they might have five or 600 risks that they're dealing with regularly and a thousand other that they don't deal with very often. Which are the risks they should focus their attention on? And we use the results of the survey to say, well, these are the kind of the key risks that organizations like yours are, uh, are worried about. So we use it in that sense. The, so the data is used from that sense. Mainly the data is used for um, you know, organizations like yourself or sharing with uh, with the government departments, and uh, it's it's more of a we do more of a brand building than exercise than the specific commercial reasons. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, Sorry. Your I lectures just join me in the giving Peter a round of